Erev Tov, Shalom, Chavrim, Ben Chag, Samek uh, here on the um, second day, or the second, the sun is set again, so we're on the second day of, of Shavuot, uh, the holiday celebrated by Israel. And uh, one thing that I, I did not mention last night, but of course, uh, those of you that are Christians all know that this is the Feast of Pentecost. This is also the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was at this particular feast as well. And uh, so we'll, we'll touch base in, in this tonight because we're looking at the story of Ruth. And uh, I, I, I'm sure many of you, maybe you already know these things if you've listened to some of the older videos we've done on, this, on, on Ruth. But uh, since Ruth is part of the reading of the Jewish tradition, I wanted to share the story with you. So those of you that know the story of Ruth already, we know that Naomi... And her husband, uh, Elimelech, they go down into, and their two sons go down into Moab because there's a great famine on in Israel. So uh, this kind of drives them out of the land. They go in search of a better life. And while there, um, uh, Elimelech, he dies. That's uh, Naomi's husband. Uh, her two sons, they ended up marrying Moabite girls. And, uh, and they died about 10 years after the death of their father. And at this point, we find, uh, we find in the story that um, Naomi gets word back that there is bread in Bethlehem, uh, which is all ironic, uh, or uh, that's around verse 6. So let me just read that to you. Then, said, then she said, arose with her daughters-in-law, and that she might return from the country of Moab, for, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. So, uh, of course, they're from Bethlehem. They're Ephraimites. And uh, so Naomi is now going to go back. Her daughter-in-law start out with her, both of them, both Orpah and, uh, and Ruth. But we find, though, that, that Orpah ends up turning back. I mean, uh, of course, there's some persuasion there. Naomi is, is telling them, why do you want to go with me? You know, I, I'm, I'm not, you wouldn't hang around if I were to have another son anyway, so why would you want to go with me? And so finally, Orpah, she just kind of gives in and goes back, but Ruth refuses to go back. Now, I found that very interesting because all the types and shadows here that you're going to see in the story of Ruth deal with modern day Israel. It deals with the dispersion, the diaspora of Israel. In fact, I believe that has a lot to do with the death of her sons and the death of her husband uh, when Israel was in her diaspora over the years. And this is both the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It's such a mass killing of the Jews uh, that took place here. And so we see all the sons have been killed. And ironically, this may be very well where even the rabbis take the idea of uh, the mother being the heir for the sons. And uh, I can't say that, um, well, we know that it was because of the Holocaust. But again, uh, later we'll find out that Ruth is going to have a son that will be raised up in memory of her husband. And this is one reason why David is considered an Ephraimite and uh, from the tribe of Judah, because Boaz is from the type, tribe of Judah. And he's being born uh, in, to raise up seed for his, uh, um, not his physical dead, but his dead that would, would, that would have been his uh, kinsman, and that being um, uh, Machalon, uh, the man that died that was married to Ruth. So anyway, this is where he gets the two titles there, the, being an Ephraimite and from the tribe of Judah both. So technically from the tribe of Judah, but through the uh, birthright of Ruth uh, and her uh, deceased husband, an Ephraimite. So as we read in the story here, so she went out of the place where she was and the two daughters-in-law with her, and they took the road to return to the land of, of, of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each one of your to your mother's house. And as we said, uh, they kind of fight it to begin with, but Orpah does return. Now, oddly enough, when she speaks to Orpah, uh, after Orpah goes back, she says to, to, uh, to Ruth, um, 
Right? Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, this is in verse 14, but Ruth held fast to her, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Now, Orpah reminds me of many of the church, nominal church uh, organizations of today. And rather than staying true to Israel, they have gone back to serving their gods. They've gone back to the mother that birthed them, which is the Vatican. They've gone back to their gods. And believe me, the Vatican has many gods. It's not just uh, uh, in a Trinitarian belief. They have saints and, and they pray to dead saints. They have all kinds of gods there. Even the Pope, they make him in the place of God. So, very strange indeed, but Orpah is a type of the Christian today that will not walk with Israel. And Naomi represents Israel. And you're going to see this as we go along here. Now, Ruth refuses, absolutely refuses to go back. She is steadfast. She finally says to her mother-in-law, uh, in verse 16, For wherever thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die. There will I be buried, and the Lord do so to me. And more also, if aught but death part thee and me. What a relationship. Now, you have to remember, Ruth is a type of the true believer in Yeshua. And as we're going to see in this case of Boaz, he is that type of that Redeemer, the Redeemer of Israel. And so, amazingly so, she has such a love for Naomi, for Israel. Naomi is a type of Israel uh, that she will not let anything separate her from Naomi, or in this case, Israel, except death. Um, so, very interesting indeed. So anyway, so Naomi, she consents to this. Uh, when, they get, when they get back into the land, the people were glad to see her. And when she comes into Bethlehem, and by the way, because of Bethlehem, let me say this to my brothers and, uh, and sisters in Israel. Why do we allow the Palestinians to take control of Bethlehem? I mean, this is the place of the sepulchers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we allow such ungodly, it's just like the Temple Mount. Why are you allowing the Temple Mount to be under the control of the Palestinians? You know, I'll tell you what, let me, let me just share something with you. And Brother Gary, forgive me if I shouldn't say this, but I, I think it'd be all right. Brother Gary had an interesting dream. And, and one of the things that he was trying to find, and I may not get this exactly right, so I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit of this. He was trying to see about the coming of the Lord not trying to pinpoint it or anything, but the Lord showed him how that he would lose his house. And he said, the Lord said to him, and they will propose to take mine. And when he said all this, I was totally blown away by that because it actually has happened to him. He lost his, and this is exactly what they're, they're debating about with this two-state solution, and that is to totally take the Temple Mount and give it to the Palestinians. Where in other words, they're proposing to take God's house. You have to see. See, God still considers that area His home. You know. Now we realize the Most High dwells not in temples made by hands, but there's still something sacred to God about that spot. It always has been, and it always will be. In fact, during the millennium. We know that, you know, when God splits the Mount of Olives and He raises up a mountain out of there, there's, there's something special about this place. So just keep that thought in mind there. Um, and I really didn't go into the depths of Brother Gary's dream by no means, and I didn't want to butcher it up or nothing, but uh, I just thought it was interesting uh, that we are living at the closing hours, no doubt. So anyway, Ruth is not accepted when she comes back. Um, but anyway... Uh, when she does, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest, which is Passover. And now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a man of wealth of the family of uh, Elimelech, 
and his name was Boaz, and Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Now imagine this. The faith of this wonderful sister Ruth, she knew she was going to find favor. That's faith. That's what the true Christian today is supposed to have, is faith. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to a part of the field belonging to Boaz, um, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz uh, came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, uh, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then Boaz said to his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose maiden is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, This is the Moabite girl who came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And he said, I pray you, let me glean. Uh, excuse me. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and continued from the morning until now, scarcely spending any time in the hut. Then said Boaz to Ruth, Hearest thou not my daughter? Go not to glean another field, nor go away from here, but to keep close here to thy maidens. Let thy eyes be on the field that they reap, and, and go after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And, will, and when thou art thirsty, go to the vessels, and drink of that which is the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in thy eyes, that thou shouldest take notice of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully related to me all that thou hast done to thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband. Now, that is fascinating to me. What Here she is a Gentile, a type of the true Christian of today. And what finds her favor in the sight of Boaz? And you remember, Boaz is a type of Yahshua in this case here. He's a type of Mashiach, the Messiah. He's a type of Jesus. And he says, it's been related to me everything you've done to your mother-in-law. You know, and here's what's interesting as well. Do you realize she's gleaning from the four corners of the field? What is that? When, when God gave Moses the law, he, was, he commanded the children of Israel, do not, do not reap from the four corners of your field. Leave that for the strangers among you and the poor. Now isn't that ironic? Israel was scattered to the four corners of the earth. And God, knowing that, had Moses place that in the law, not to glean from the four corners. Why? He was going to put it in the Gentiles' hands, not just the Gentiles, but he even said the poor, to help bring in those lost of Israel that were scattered to the four corners of the earth. This is why the law of Moses re reads this way. Because God knew he would scatter Israel to the four corners of the earth. And he knew that they would be brought home. And how would they be brought home? He was going to have true believers. And not just true believers, but even the poor. He was going to bless them because they will take and be a part of bringing Israel back to her homeland. And what does he say to Ruth? Isn't it interesting? I mean, it's not just that. I mean, Ruth comes with Naomi, helping her to get back to her homeland. And he says, it's been told to me all that you've done for your mother-in-law. It's been told before the sight of Yeshua all that the Christians have done for Israel. Amazing. This is one of the reasons why I say to you, you know, this is the hour in which you can be a part of you know, of, of supporting the gospel that brings Israel to her homeland. Anyhow, let, let, me, let me continue on with you here. So 
in verse 10 here, he says, and, 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 and so she bowed herself down, and, and we have found favor in the eyes. Okay, so we, we move on then. It says, thou, And thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of the birth, and, and, and are come to a people whom thou knowest not before the Lord recompense thee, thee, thy deed. And may a full reward be given thee, the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to take refuge. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord. Thou hast comforted me, and thou hast spoken gently to thy handmaiden. Is not Yeshua the comforter? Sure he is. Mm. Have we not come to dwell under the shadow of his wings? Sure we have. I am not even like one of thy handmaids. And Boaz said to her at the mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. See, showing show that through the communion that, that the Gentile would have, be able to take part as well. That's communion that you do today. When you do a communion meal, what did Yeshua say? Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. This is what Ruth is taking part of even that as symbolic, showing that the Christian would be a part of of the Passover meal. Wow. So anyway, um, and she sat down beside the reapers, and, and he reached her parched corn, excuse me, and he reached her parched corn, and, and she did eat, and was re, uh, repleted, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her even glean among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Let, let fall also some of the handfuls of the purpose for her and leave them that she may, may glean them and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until the evening and beat out the, what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley and took it up and went into the city. And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned and she brought it out and gave to her and she had left over after she had eaten her fill. Isn't it interesting? How Boaz does that, see? And, and what is that? It's showing to the Christian that you, can't, you can never outgive, you can never outdo for God that he won't bless you. And not only did she have enough to take care of her mother-in-law, but she even had abundance. Just incredible. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where thou wert blessed is he who took, took notice of thee. And she related to her mother-in-law uh, the work she had said and the man's name where I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed is he of the Lord who has not left us steadfast love to the living and to the dead. All right. So as we go on in the story here, Naomi is going to instruct her daughter, daughter-in-law what to do. Uh, and so she keeps close to the maidens. This is in verse 23 of Boaz and to glean at the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest. And interesting, the barley and the wheat harvest. So the time span that this goes on, she goes from the crucifixion up until the time of the wheat harvest, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of the day of Pentecost that we find in the, chat book, uh, the book of Acts. So it's just interesting how this all correlates together. And so, um, and it may be well with thee, verse, uh, we're in chapter 3, and now is not Boaz of our kindred and his maid, maiden's work. Behold, the, the wind, the, he winnows barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thyself, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the threshing floor. I'm kind of skipping verses here, so just bear with me just to kind of make it go a little faster. But do not make thyself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down that thou shalt mark the place where uh, he shall lie. See, why is she not making herself known to him? Again, another parallel from what it looks like to me that it's not until after he lies down. So, and of course, it seems to be in this case here, and I'm just speaking um, not so much from Revelation, but it looks a lot like the resurrection. You know, she doesn't make herself known because Yeshua, when he came, he wasn't coming to the Gentiles as of yet. But after he laid down, after his death, burial, and resurrection, then he makes himself known to the Gentiles. Or in this case here, then she is recognized. 
So anyway, thou shalt not go in and uncover his feet, excuse me, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said to her, all that thou sayest will I do. And she went into the threshing floor. We know about how that happens. Uh, and she lays down, she pulls up the cover, lays up under it right there at his feet, uh, which is, to me, I could not help but think of, um, I know a little different now, but uh, I thought about the woman that was a, a prostitute that came to Jesus when he was invited to Simon's house, and she washed his feet with her tears uh, and, and dried them with the hairs of her head. Can't say it's the same coalition, but just I, I, I couldn't help but think of that. And turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet, and he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou, the Lord thy, my daughter, for thou hast shown more loyalty in the latter end than at the beginning. Isn't that interesting? In the latter end, she shows more loyalty. That's what we're going to find with the believers today. The true believers today will show more loyalty in the end. What the true Christian will have to do today in, the, in light of the persecution that the churches that will go against us because we don't side with the Vatican and we don't side with the denominations that are joining up with the Vatican. See, we're not going to be part of Orpa and the group that she serves that goes back and serves their, their gods. So... It's, it's a situation where we're finding ourselves more and more. We have to be careful, and it has to be done in secret. But yet, she's blessed, and he even says that, she, she's, that she's got, you know, she did greater now at the end than she did at the beginning. He says, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do thee all that thou requirest. For the city of thy people knows that thou art a virtuous woman, and now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, yet there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he, if he will perform uh, the part of a kinsman well, let, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will not do a part of the kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of the kinsman to thee, and the Lord lives. Lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she arose before the, for they could recognize another person. And he said, let it be known that a woman came, excuse me, let it, let it not be known that a woman came into the threshing floor. Also he said, bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. And she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley he gave me, for he said to me, Do not go empty to thy mother. Isn't that incredible? You know, I don't know if that's a type of the rapture or not, but I couldn't help but wonder it, because it's done before anybody can realize that she was there. I, I don't know. I've wondered that before, but I can't say for sure. But isn't it interesting? Again, God blesses her, or in this case here, Boaz blesses her in such an abundance, and she takes it back to her mother-in-law. Amazing. Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until thou knowest how the matter will fall, for the man will not rest until he finishes the matter today. There's your seventh seal in Revelation, where the Bible says, there was silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour. See? Now, how, why would I say that? Because there's also another place that says, let everything keep silent, for he has risen up out of his holy habitation. And that relates directly to the seventh seal, the silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour. In the Bible, it also says in, in the Tanakh, let everything keep silent. See, there's a silence in, in Revelation. For he's what? Risen up out of his holy habitation. What is it? He's coming to redeem Israel. And he won't rest until Israel's redeemed. But the only way he can redeem, or the only way he can get Ruth as his bride, a Gentile bride, he's got to first redeem Naomi. He's got to redeem Israel first. And this is one of the reasons why I've said I, I can't quite place where that rapture takes place. 
You understand what I'm saying? Because Israel's got to be redeemed first in order for Christ to take a bride. They've got to recognize him as Mashiach. And once they recognize him, then he can take Ruth as his bride. That's exactly what happens. So he doesn't rest. Like, like God, he doesn't rest. He's, now he's about to redeem Israel. He comes up off that mercy seat. Mm. So anyway, he does. He goes, though, and he asks the other kinsman that's near to him. But, you know, the other kinsman, he was about to redeem everything that was Naomi's until... Boaz says, you'll also have to take Ruth the Moabite. And you'll have to raise up seed unto her, unto the dead. And if you don't do that, then you can't do it. Well, you know, this is the problem with Satan. He doesn't have the ability to raise the dead, does he? So, when that came to be in the issue, he backed out. That's something he can't do. Because why? He's not a life giver. Boaz is a representation of Yeshua. You know, I was going to, I told you I was going to share some things with you about the book of Daniel. Let me just give you one nugget from there because I know some of you guys have been wondering. And there's more there. I, I, I don't want to go into it now, but I'll save it for later. But let me just share one of the most precious things that I notice about the book of Daniel. Daniel, his own life foreshadows and shows us what we should look for in the Messiah. In fact, here's how we know. When King Nebuchadnezzar has the dream that no one could interpret, in fact, not just a matter of interpret it, the king required that you knew his dream without him telling the dream. And none of the astrologers, none of the soothsayers, none of the magicians, nobody knew it. And when Daniel heard that they're going to be put to death, including Daniel and, and his three brethren, they're going to be all be put to death if somebody doesn't reveal to the king his dream, he sends word to the king to be able to find favor in his sight, and he lets him know. He doesn't know himself. He said, but God does know. And he says, now will give me time to seek God and get that answer. God was setting something up for, for us, especially for the Jewish people. Remember when I said to you recently, Yeshua makes a prophecy about when he gives you the parable, when he says about uh, Abraham, uh, when, he's, when, when the rich man uh, is in hell, and he sees Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham, and he says, raise up one of the dead and send them to my kindred that they not come into this place. And Abraham said, they, would not, they won't believe one, though he'd be raised from the dead. See? There it was, speaking of Yeshua, again. But he said, uh, he says like this here, he says, take and... <laughs> He says, they have, the, they have Moses and the prophets. Now, what was, what was Yeshua doing with this parable? He was showing us how Israel will believe. This is why you see Abraham involved in this, in this particular parable. Because Israel didn't believe the resurrection, but hidden in the prophets, hidden in the writings of Moses, is the identity of Mashiach. When Daniel came and knew the secrets of the, of the king's dream without being told the dream, not only did he know the interpretation, but he also knew the dream. And he says that he, the only way he could get this was from God. And then this man Yeshua comes on the scene and he knows all these things about people. He knows what's in their mind without them speaking it. He's not running and going and asking God about it either, is he? He knows it because he is God. He perceived that they were thinking like, for example, when the apostles trying to think which one's going to be the greatest among us. He perceived what the Pharisees were thinking about. 
and would tell them before they could do anything. He knew that the woman at the well had five husbands and the one she's living with now was not hers. Now see, what's funny, the Pharisees and Sadducees said, he's of Beelzebub. You'd have said the same thing then about Daniel, wouldn't you? When he come back and knew the secret of the king's heart because he went and sought God to know it. The problem was, was God was giving you a sign through the prophet Daniel that the only way you're going to know the secret of a man's heart like that or the secret of his dream is it would take God. And when Yeshua was here, he knew those secrets. How could he know it unless he was God standing in a human body? He didn't say, wait just a minute, guys, by the way. Wait just a minute, the woman at the well. Let me go see God because he'll know what your life's all about. He didn't have to sit there and say, wait just a minute. I know you guys are probably thinking something evil about me, you Pharisees and Sadducees. Let me go seek God to see what he has to say about it. No, he was putting what Daniel went and prayed about into action without having to go pray about it. Think about that. And here again, all these stories, Boaz, everything, the book of Ruth, the book of Esther, the book of David. It's, it's all laced through here. Joshua, the writings of Moses, David putting the cup in Benjamin's bag, the innocent brother. Why? Because he knew he'd be guilty uh, 1,500 years later when they cried out, let his blood be upon us and on our children. He also knew that 3,500 years ago there would be Jews today that were not guilty that are part of the Benjamite group. But you've got to decide what you're going to do with the cup that was in the bag. Anyway, let me just say this in closing. You know, there is no way possible. I, I, let, me, let me just correct that. God is the one that is involved in everything that we're doing by His grace. I, I trust that He's leading me and in, in to, to, to see these things for a purpose. I don't know where it's going to go. I can't say exactly what's going to happen. This is your blessing. We love you. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, by the way, the brother from North Carolina, I, I did get your message. Uh, I will call you tomorrow, my brother. We love you guys. God bless you. Pray for us. We are seeking His perfect will in everything we do.